Portions of the following episode were recorded after the coronavirus pandemic started, but before the murder of George Floyd and related protests. We know these events have had and will continue to have tremendous impact on our lives and our community, and of course, the work of artists. We assert that Black Lives Matter and will be working on content that deal with such topics. As always, we'd love to hear more about what you'd like to hear from us. Stay tuned for ways to reach out to us at the end of the show. Welcome to the Relief Podcast from the Akron Art Museum, comfort and joy for these uncertain times. I'm Seema Rao, Deputy Director and Chief Experience Officer. And I'm Gina Thomas-McGee, Curator of Education. So today's topic is joy. Um, And I have to admit, I am somebody who uh, read a lot of um, uh, Marie Kondo. And so I had sparked joy many years ago and cleaned my house. And I I think about it sometimes um, because now I have a clean house that I can live in because I'm here 24-7. But... So whenever I hear the word joy, that's what makes, that I think of. What do you think of when you hear the word joy? Oh, I don't know. I just think of like unadulterated happiness. Like joy to me doesn't feel like something that is sustained. It feels like a moment. Like I feel like it's like a pocket of emotion, like a a spark of joy to me. Oh, you said spark. Did you put that in my brain? Sorry. (laughs) Spark of joy. (laughs) But you know, that's actually... Great. That's great for right now, because I've been reading a lot about uh, forced positivity when we don't feel really happy. And how do you kind of counteract that? And happy is a sustained feeling, right? It seems like, but joy, that idea of just having it be like firefly, you know, we're almost a firefly season. Um, And there is something about just being in that moment. And it might be all we can hope for. You know, there's things like and having a spark of joy when you see a popsicle. That's like amazing. Exactly. And to realize that it is temporary and to be able to savor it, I feel like, I mean, what more can you ask them for, really? No, it, it's, I mean, right now is a perfect thing. It's warm out, go to the park. Like, we were at the busiest national park in America, Cuyahoga Valley National Park, and we saw a bald eagle, and it was the most exciting oh. thing. It, you say, oh, but it had a um, fish, and it's talons it was flying away with a fish there's a sculpture um where i go in the Cuyahoga valley national park that has it's a sculpture of an eagle sort of like i don't know disemboweling a fish but uh there there could be beauty in that true right (laughs) right you know circle of life and all life is beautiful but but the point is that we saw a bald eagle and if you think of like that moment and just being in that authentic moment it's it's that's huge, except for hard. I don't know if I'm always in the moment. It is really difficult. It's funny that you say that about um, being in the park because it makes me think of those Robert Glenn Ketchum photographs that we have of the Cuyahoga Valley National Park. And those are so filled with joy and are so momentary as well. They're like capturing just a snippet of the sunshine and the way that you know the leaves are filtering the light all the way down through the rocks they're so beautiful and I don't know I find joy in that for sure there's one that has sort of looks like mist or some sort of like you know fog coming up and I always think have I ever noticed that moment you know that there must be like a second that you see that before the heat um you know dissipates the fog or whatever that is and I think oh that's so nice that we have it captured you know? yes do you think photographers are better at joy than other people because they capture such fleeting moments that's a good question there is that study that says that um when you take a photo snapshot on your phone you're not experiencing the moment and that if you want to be in the moment I go to the school that my girls go to are um their head of school always says, be in the moment at this, with your kids at this performance, don't take pictures because that's when you are not in the moment. Right. I and don't know. So maybe they're disagree. capturing the moment for us. Maybe they're dis- they're like passing the joy on to us. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe because they're sort of using their eye to show us something. Yeah. I don't know. I do think that one of the moments that one of my best, I'm not always great at being in the moment, but I would say being in the galleries is when I'm in the moment, like walking through and looking at something, 
I've been trying to teach myself to rethink works that I didn't originally like. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I walk in and I see, uh, I guess I'm going to out myself, the Viola Fry Women in the World. I've come to, I've grown to appreciate it. Um, but one of the things I grew to appreciate was the quality of the glazing. And so I had to keep mm. looking at it, and looking at it, and looking at it. And being in that moment was huge. And you Definitely. Yeah. And you know, it's funny that you say that because so often I find my joy related to artworks when I talk about it with other people, you know, because they find something so delightful or surprising or they learn something. And like, then I just attach that joy to the artwork from then on, even if I didn't particularly care for it to begin with. So I, I thank goodness for our visitors <laughs> for yeah, teaching me those things. It's like a point of relevancy, right? It's like a moment you've shared like a, an emotion together. I agree. Actually, I would say not ours because I haven't taught our William Summer very much. We're about to turn it over to Reggie. Um, but uh, I've taught William Summer before in the galleries. And I don't know if I actually felt either way about it, but mm. I have a different reason that I feel happy about it. I, it's takes, he lived in, um, in the valley. And, or he had a yeah. farm in the valley, right? And so he, he, he was taking moments that we've experienced and making them joy. And so when I've taught it, I love when people tell me their stories and why this matters to them in terms of their life. So they didn't know William Summer, but they knew the valley, Cuyahoga Valley, and they knew how beautiful it was and they could see this and it felt real to them. And you're right, their stories and their moment of joy, they felt like he was capturing their joy, sort of like Ketchum. He was capturing their joy of the space because he doesn't use colors. I mean, I don't know, but I don't think the Cuyahoga Valley is, you know, yellow and purple. Um, <laughs> it is green, of course, but it has, it is sort of, um, magical it's a mad they're magical stories of the valley definitely and i think th those are the two things that really make me feel joy when i look at that uh summer work it's the palette is just like i don't know pure joy the yellows and the pinks and the purples and that like really fresh green and then the, the kind of sense of familiarity i have with it mm -hmm. because even though it is sort of like wildly over the top in color it's so familiar of a scene. I feel like when I drive over um, an overpass on 71 highways, these are Northeast Ohio highways, 71 <laughs> or 77. Um, I feel like if I look out my window, that's what I see. No, you're right. And actually, you know, you said highly, that's highly unrealistic, but unless I think about it, I don't think of them as unrealistic. No. You know, there's almost, it's sort of like, I mean, it's expressionistic. It expresses exactly how I feel about those spaces. It's funny. And, you know, somebody said, um, somebody once told me about Summer that his work is um, being like focused, you know, being sort of connected to Europe. They're not bound by the colors of nature to show how they feel about nature. Yeah. And so often when you really take a chance to like let go of what's in your brain and really look at something, the color of objects and places and scenes is really not what you'd expect. That the piece Reggie's going to tell us about is called Landscape with Yellow Clouds. And, you know, if somebody told you to paint a cloud, you wouldn't pick up yellow necessarily, but um, there are yellow clouds. Yeah. And, you know, actually, it makes me go back to what you were saying about teaching in the galleries. You also don't know, maybe he had a lot of artist friends. Maybe he was listening to someone tell him how beautiful the clouds were and it made him feel that way. You know, like we right. actually, there, there's something great about the artist's process, you know, going back to the joy of being in the moment. You're in the moment with something that somebody real made. Mm. And you don't know. It's like all your interpretation. It could be anything. It's true. That's a really good point. So I'm about to turn it over to Reggie um, to talk a little bit about William Summer. Paint. Enjoy! <laughs> Hi everyone, it's the museum's curator of community engagement, Reggie, and I'm here with this week's Deep Dive. Today, we're talking about joy with William Summers' Landscape with Yellow Clouds. In this work, we see a landscape built from bright yellows, greens, blues, and pinks. Splashed here and there are a few strokes of red and orange, alluding to smatterings of wildflowers and leaves sprinkled throughout the scene. The work lands somewhere in between abstract and realistic, which feels like a fitting place to be when talking about joy. You can't touch joy, 
like you would a tree or a blade of grass, but it can still evoke a seemingly tangible feeling, much in the same way that summer's tints jump off the canvas. What summer has created in this work is a kind of jubilant choreography of hues. Pinks and yellows clatter against one another to form clouds, greens and browns subtly weave together to create billowing grasses, and blues swarm over creamy purples and oranges to shape mountains and sky. In short, Summer has used colors to encapsulate the essence of this land and the feelings it evokes. This form of expression was a technique he borrowed from one of the greatest painters of the modern era, a man named Henry Matisse. You may not know Matisse by name, but you might recognize his works from their brilliant tones. Matisse's wild use of pigment was so non-naturalistic and out of the ordinary that he and his peers were dubbed fauves, which is a French word meaning wild beasts. Instead of looking at how things naturally appeared in the world, they were interested in the ways that color could express energy and sensations. For Matisse and those who came after him, like William Summer, the visual realities of a subject were secondary to its ability to generate emotion, and an artist's job was to bring out those emotions through color. And bring them out they did. Like the Fauves, Summer's works often seem to buzz with delight. To me, works by these artists feel like a celebration of the awesome potential for joy that pulses through the world at any given moment. These paintings are a reminder that even when it is overtaken by painful realities, joy can still be found running through it all. I think I'll hang out with these billowy clouds a little bit longer, but I'll meet you back here next time for another deep dive. Yes, Reggie, so many feelings swirling around in those colors. I don't think I'll ever get sick of looking at William Summer's works. Speaking of someone we never tire of, we're going to throw it over to Caitlin today for this week's Shop Talk, where she's talking to artist Shane Wynn. Hey, it's Caitlin for this episode Shop Talk with Akron photographer Shane Wynn. You might have seen Shane's work throughout our city as she divides her time between photojournalism and her personal projects and exhibits. As a true Akronite, Shane's ultimate goal is capturing those in our community, highlighting their stories and experiences that mirror the narratives that are happening globally. Currently though, Shane is on the road with her family traveling the United States. So, if you're like me, you'll be so inspired to do the same after this Shop Talk with Shane Wynn. Hey there. Hey, how you doing? Good, how are you? I'm doing well. So where are you at now? We just drove through the Adirondacks and we were at the Thousand Island region in New York uh, like the day before yesterday. How's it been? I mean, what, how many days has it been now? Like, It's only been like a little bit over a week and uh, it is intense. It is like really rewarding and really challenging and you're like a pioneer. That's, a, that's like the best way I can say it. You're like a modern day pioneer. Like we have to, you're in a covered wagon essentially. It's just a big shiny silver one. Yeah. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. So it's something. Yeah. Well, I don't want to keep too much of your time. So I sent along that William Sommer painting. What is your initial feedback or not feedback, but response to it? I thought it was um, really playful and um, it kind of reminded me of bubble letters, like the bubble letters I used to draw in the 80s. It was really obviously more about the person that created the painting than it was about the actual landscape. So they were sort of projecting their own feelings and experience on this landscape. And I understand from re reading about it as well that um, that he had just recently been to the ar armory um, in, in New York and so had all these influences. And you can really directly see and like the specific influences in the piece. So I thought that uh, that was pretty neat. I like that you put his like personality into the painting because it does have such a uh, light to it. And um, I love the bubble letter reference. Um, yeah. I definitely see that now that you said that. The clouds are actually very interesting. They're, they're rather suggestive. I mean, I don't know if you noticed that, but I thought they were some interesting shapes in those clouds. <laughs> And I mean, I was thinking about it too, like um, that's sort of adult fun, right? So that's like a part of it being an adult. So it, it's it's youthful and, and, but it's also sort of like, I thought there were some fun suggestions made there, but maybe that's just me. 
<laughs> no, I love that. I haven't personally seen it in that lens because I'm used to showing it to children on tours. Okay. But, yeah. <laughs> I love that perspective. It just adds more interest to that painting to me now. Well, and if you, so Matisse was one of the influences that they talked about at that Armory show. And the clouds actually look like Matisse subjects to me, like characters, which were all yeah. bodies, right? So that, it took on that body sort of shape. And I saw a lot of that same color palette, Matisse color palette too. You're going into this artwork more than I even did. So I love that. <laughs> I'm a researcher. Um, like, oh, what are we talking about, you know? Right. So the topic is joy. What does that mean to you or to your work? Or how do you interpret that? So joy to me is to experience anything at its height, at its, like, things that have met their fullest potential. So that could be a person performing. That could be an architectural marvel. That could be, like, just the best damn sandwich I have ever had. Like, this is the best version of this sandwich I've ever had. That is joy to me. It's really um, the ability for people, places, things to be at their best potential. Okay. And it always, like, I cry. I, I really, like, you can tell when I'm experiencing joy. I just, I'll just cry. So I know I have a, like a very good indicator for, for when I feel that. <laughs> I like that your indicator is crying because usually when you think of joy, it's like elated, big smiles and you're just like crying because it's so happy to you. And um... Oh, it's embarrassing. I mean, I, when I photograph things, sometimes I will witness things that bring me immense joy and cry. And so I'm like walking around taking pictures and crying, <laughs> like oh. crying. Shooting eye. It's silly. I mean, I've been in the middle of like Highland Square. I'm shooting an event. I'm just bawling and taking pictures. People probably think I'm really weird. It just but. proves how much you love your work, right? That's true. Yeah. yeah. Right. I guess I'm doing the right. I guess I'm doing what I should be doing then. Right. Um, so a bit of a switch up. Now I know circumstances might have changed with you on the road, but what's the first thing you do in the morning? They have definitely changed because the first thing I do in the morning. <laughs> is I fold down our dinette. So we, in our camper, in our trailer, we have a dinette that also doubles as a bed during the night. And my mother-in-law sleeps in the bed. So the first thing I do is my mother-in-law gets out of bed and then I turn it back into a dinette and then I set it up so my kids can do remote schooling. So the first thing you're doing is switching up your whole lifestyle in that camper. Yeah, something you learn on the road is like we take for granted that we have one space that's used for one thing. Here, everything has multiple uses. So the dinette is also a bed. And the table where I prepare the food is like also where I set up my kids' schooling. And I'm in a vehicle right now talking to you, which so now it's my personal interview space. Right. <laughs> but it's also what we drive. So right. Places. Yeah. And what are your three Desert Island studio needs? So that would be my camera and Photoshop and, you know, some, something to write on or write with. I kind of wear different hats. I am an artist and also a photojournalist. And so sometimes I have to just write people's names. And I, I mean, you have to get valid information in order to properly, you know, um, name like who you're photographing, things like that. People can't even use the content if you don't have the right names and information. And then also I just write about my experiences. I have a travel uh, blog right now. So I, I post my pictures and then I write about my experience. And sometimes I like the writing better than the photographs. It's, it's pretty interesting. You brought up with your trailer that you're, it's like multi-purpose. And yet, mm -hmm. so you're constantly used to switching things up because that's what you're doing in your work. You're balancing photojournalism with um, more like fine art photography, right? So yeah, kind of that toss up there. It's different um, half, kind of weird to switch in between, but yep. Yeah. And maybe out of those or something different, what's your favorite tool? my 85 millimeter portrait lens. I'm a portrait photographer. So it's interesting that you had me analyze a landscape because <laughs> um, I, I mean, like a landscape to me is a backdrop for a portrait. I'm just going to like look for a person to put in it. But um, oh yeah, definitely. When I was looking at that painting beforehand, I thought, oh, it is kind of weird that I chose Shane for this one because all of your work has portraiture and that narrative to it. Right. Um, so I think it's fitting that you added the artist narrative into that painting instead of just viewing <laughs> right. it as a yeah. landscape, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm always going to make it about the person. Yeah, I'm right. Like, it's all about the people, but you know, I mean, I love, I do love landscapes. I, I understand their significance as well. So what's your silver lining during COVID-19, during all these movements happening? Yeah, I have a lot of silver linings. In fact, I have an impressive amount of, of silver linings because of sort of the way that it's like things that would normally sort of position me in a negative way have positioned me in a positive way in this circumstance. So for example, because my kids are learning remotely 
um, we've been liberated to hit the road and for nine months and our kids are like learning on the road while we, you know, document the U.S. Um, I've been able to tell, you know, I'm telling like a really interesting story because of the particular circumstances during COVID. So everywhere I go, I photograph things that are just like these sort of surreal environments. Um, also, we actually named our trailer Silver and it's short for Silver Lining because this whole trip is a silver lining as a result of COVID. So we say, hi-ho silver away. Oh, that's so fitting. You did the branding so well for this. Oh, thanks. <laughs> I love branding. I'm, I'm fascinated by branding. I think that's a, a modern day art form. Definitely. Sort of a switch up. I have five this or that questions. Okay. So old versus new. New. Half full or half empty? Half full. Morning or night? Night. Uh, fast or slow? Mm, so, uh, probably fast. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and last one, salty or sweet? Sweet. Do you have a sweet tooth snack that you love? Yes, I love so many sweets. Um, right now, I'm, I'm into pie. I love every Ooh. pie. I love lemon meringue pie. I love berry pie, pumpkin pie, apple pie, any kind of pie. Are you getting pies on the road throughout the States? I have not yet, oh. but definitely. Because everywhere we're staying is like, it's like pumpkin spice world. We're on the right. East Coast and it's, there's pumpkins everywhere. And every place we stay, there's like a picture of an apple. So... <laughs> There's little pies everywhere we go. Yeah. Do you mind summarizing it for the listeners, what you're up to with your family? Yes. As a result of COVID and our kids being remote learning, we sort of uh, put all the pieces together to take advantage of, a, of something we've always wanted to do, which was to hit the road with our kids in a trailer and document the U.S. through photography and video. My husband's a videographer. So we're sort of capturing several things, um, just our own family, our personal experience, um, our kids' like remote learning experience, and then also just the country during COVID, the country pre-election. There's just so many interesting things going on. And we don't have any hard and fast for what the actual result, what, what, what our deliverable will be. But, but this is an opportunity for us to keep it loose and just really capture what is around us and let the, to the story tell itself. But it could be a, a documentary, it could be a docu-series, it could be a photography series. We're just amassing a huge amount of content and the story will define itself at the end. Right. I've told many of my coworkers and we're all just amazed by this opportunity you are taking and maybe a little jealous. Uh, it's <laughs> so incredible. Um, you have a Patreon for it, which you sent to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, thank you. Yeah, we have, I think we have like 62 supporters at this point. It has just been absolutely amazing, the support that we've gotten from home. And um, the pay, it's, it's www.patreon forward slash where the winds take you. And uh, we have different levels. We send people postcards from the road. Um, we can send you like the, our favorite things that we find along the way. But it's a site that um, supports content creation. And that's what we do. So um, I write like about the good, the bad, and the ugly of this trip. And there's a really fun um, blog. And then there's video vlogs. And then my husband and I combine our abilities too and sort of we're experimenting with different ways to use for example me doing a vo voiceover of my writing of like sort of my diary of the day on top of videos and images that I took and video that he took so oh, wow. we also have, we have drones we have underwater cameras and we're just really um I've never had the opportunity to be so loose in the in in like creating so it's really kind of fun and I think it'll just sort of form as we go and right. we'll see what we come back with but we're definitely going to have content. <laughs> yes, I love that so much. And yeah. what was the timeline of you and your um, husband figuring out to do this trip? <laughs> well, yeah, it was like two months ago, like two months from the time that we left Akron. And this is a great story. So my husband was drinking whiskey and he said, you know what? We should just get out of here and we should just create and hit the road. And, you know, it was just like a moment while he was drinking whiskey. And the next morning I was like, hey, when do we leave for that trip you <laughs> talked about? <laughs> and then it was a matter of us like talking ourselves back into what was really just a drunken moment. But it actually started to make sense because if we stay at home right now, there's just limited work that we can do, limited ways that we can navigate and be in the world. 
But if we take advantage of um, some opportunities through SBA loans that we have, it's a chance for us to expand out and like make this big project in the middle of a pandemic. So it's really this really sweet spot that we found that's enabled us to, to do something we wouldn't have been able to do in normal life, ironically. Mm -hmm. I love that it was a whiskey moment. <laughs> It's, you know, but, yeah, don't say nothing good ever comes of drinking whiskey. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for taking time out of Vermont to um, chat with me today. Well, thanks for thinking of me. It's nice to connect back to home because we are big Akronites. And um, anytime we can have a connection back home, we just absolutely love it. So thank you so much. Good. All right, excellent. So um, we are so happy to be doing this and reaching out to you. If you want to reach back out to us, please do give us a call. A phone number is 330-790-1622 or throw us an email at podcast at akronartmuseum.org. Thanks, everybody. Thank you for listening to the Relief Podcast from the Akron Art Museum. Comfort and joy for these uncertain times. Relief Podcast is a production of the Akron Art Museum. Today, you heard from staff members Seema Rao, Tina Thomas-McGee, Reggie Lynch, and Caitlin Evans, along with our guest artist, Shane Wynn. Special thank you to Jordan King, who wrote and performed all the podcast theme music. Until next time, take care and live creative.